Hello, my name is Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guests the question why. We learn about passion, purpose, and the human experience. Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities, with the generous support of the Wyoming Community Foundation, this is What's Your Why? talking to Ke Aloha. He was named the first Poet Laureate of Hawaii in 2012. As an internationally acclaimed poet and storyteller, he has performed throughout the world. Welcome, Ke Aloha. Hi, how's it going, Emmy? Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm loving to hear the story of your journey to become a poet. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, growing up, I was a little bit into poetry. That was kind of like something I dabbled in, right? But... I got heavily into math and science. That was my jam. So I went as full force as I could into that f- those fields. And so I ended up getting a degree as a nuclear engineer, which is really just applied nuclear physics, right? With a minor in writing. <laughs> so that, that, that writing thing was still kind of there, but it wasn't my main focus. The thing is, though, is that after I had graduated from college, I decided to to sort of take a a mini leap away from science for a moment. And I got into business consulting. I was doing that in San Francisco. And while I was there in San Francisco, um, you know, I was working, I was doing that typical, it wasn't even nine to five. It was like nine to seven, nine to eight. It was crazy. It was like, go to work, come home, eat dinner, pass out, wake up, go to work the next day. And it was like rinse and repeat. And I was find myself wasting away. And one day, I was just like, I had enough of it. I was like, I want to go and experience San Francisco. I'm living in this amazing city, and I haven't seen any of it, you know? Um, so I picked up one of the papers. It was either The Guardian or the SF Weekly, one of those, like, you know, weekly papers where they, uh, they have sort of the events of the week. One of the events that caught my eye was it was a slam poetry event, and it was happening maybe three blocks away from where I lived. And so there was a no, uh, it was a no-brainer, right? I was like, okay, I used to be into poetry, let me go check this out. So I went there, paid my admission, sat down, and while I'm sitting there, I get presented with some of the best slam poets in San Francisco, and they just get up there and they just lay it all out. You know, I'm sitting there, and oh, my brain starts tingling, and my, my spine starts getting warm, and I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness, where has this art form been my entire life? Because it combined so much of what I loved. You know, it combined the writing with philosophy, with drama, with thinking, and I was hooked. I was completely hooked. And so I went home and I started writing. The next day at my business job, I'm sitting there in the cubicle and I'm typing out poems. I look like I'm working, but I'm actually just typing out poems and I just couldn't stop. And that night, I went back home and wrote more poems the next morning write more poems. I just couldn't stop. And then I kept going to all these poetry events happening around the Bay Area. And there came a point in time where I was living two lives, basically. My daytime life was this business job, but my my nighttime life was was poetry. And I just decided I need to go and do the poetry. I want to go and do the poetry thing, so let's do it. Let's leave this career and let's see where the arts can take me. So I took that leap of faith and... I've never looked back since. It was the best decision I ever made. That's an amazing story and very inspiring for for one thing. And I think just getting bitten by that creative bug that mm. just kept driving you on. Yep. When you walked away and you were had enough confidence to get up and perform your first poem. The first poem? Yeah. That was in San Francisco. Um, so I've been watching all these poets doing their thing. And I was like, I just want to try, you know. So I ended up signing up at what? at the time was the largest poetry slam in the nation. It was 300 people strong and it was a really vibrant scene. It was amazing. I signed up. I was like, I just want to read a poem. And, and I got up there and I did this piece and the MC, the host at the time, he, you know, as I was walking off stage, he, he gave me a five. He's like, respect, you know, he's like, thanks. Thanks for coming through. And he really like showed that appreciation, and it was, a, it was a great encouragement to just keep going, keep writing, keep performing. So I did, you know. Um, so that first time 
was just wanting to participate in something that I had loved so much. And the barriers to entry for Poetry Slam are so, so minimal. Like, mm-hmm. you can, on any night, it's an open mic, basically. You can just sign up and get up on there. So I just decided, you know what, this, you know, I'm not getting any younger. We've got nothing to lose. Nothing's going to happen up there on stage that, you know, is going to bring me bodily harm. So let's take a chance. Let's take a shot. Let's see what this does. And I think it's really inspiring that you started out as an engineer, and that was your schooling. And then now you're a poet. And I would love to hear your thoughts about the intersection of arts and science. <laughs> well, the intersection between arts and science is, there's so much there. And I actually struggled with that intersection when I first started as an artist, right? I was like, I would try to sort of bring elements of science into what I was doing, but it was all contrived, right? But then I started to develop a style that, I mean, my, my writing started to reflect critical analysis and problem solving and like, you know, the sort of deconstruction of problems. So like I would write about things, but I would break them down to the composite parts and I would solve each part and then wrap it up to, to get to the higher like level of understanding, which is what science does, right? Science is continually breaking things down, solving them and building them back up. So I started to use those sort of analyses, those scientific type logical analyses in my poetry. And that was sort of like a the first step of combining art and science. But then, what was it, maybe about 2011. In 2011, I found out that my partner and I were going to have a child. And, you know, me, I just, I was like, oh my gosh, what, what like, this is, I started freaking out. I was like, what is this going to be like that? I, I wasn't ready for parenthood, you know, all these things, right? All these things that fly out into your head. So I asked my partner to, at the time, I asked her to take off for a little, little bit so I could stay home and just write and sort of make sense of all of this stuff. So as I was writing, I started to think about what it was going to be like to be a father. And the one thing that kept coming into my brain was that one day this child is going to ask me or, you know, ask us where we come from. And for me, I don't have a thing that I subscribe to, like a religion of sorts that I subscribe to that's like where we come from. For me, it's about science. So I started to write scientifically how we got here as humans. But I started with the Big Bang, you know, because that's the beginning of it all. So as I was writing about the Big Bang, you know, these sub- subatomic particles, they started to have faces. This is matter and antimatter. They had, they had faces and they had intentions. They hated each other. There was this big war, this battle that ended up resolving itself in this peace uh, festival, which was Woodstock. And I was like, oh, this, this is strange. This is happening? Really? Okay, well, let's see what happens next in the stars. So I started to uh, write about what was happening in the stars. And, you know, the angle that I took with that, I was like, oh, each star is like a disco, a discotheque in the 70s. And, we're, you know, we're going in, it's ladies' night, and we're dancing. And, like, each dance that we do is a different configuration of, of protons and neutrons or females and males. Uh, and, you know, we're doing all these different dances, uh, having all these different numbers of configurations. And each configuration is a different element on the periodic table. And so we're building out hydrogen and helium and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all those things that, you know, are up there on the periodic table. And then I was like, okay, well, oh, cool. So the, the story continued on and on and on. The solar system I started to write about, and that became the uh, uh, sort of a a, a triangle love story between the sun, the earth, and the moon. And, you know, we, we sort of, like, play with those tensions of love and relationships. And then the earth gets pregnant, and we don't know who the baby daddy is, but we think it's the moon. The moon thinks it's his. Uh, and so they go, the earth and the moon, they go through this pregnancy together, and, you know, all those sort of ridiculous things that happen during pregnancy start to come out, you know, like the sort of the crankiness and the, or the, or the, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm, I feel so fat and things like that. Like all those things start happening. And then eventually, um, at, you know, at the ninth month, the earth, she's ready to give birth and she gives birth to a single celled organism. She gives birth to a bacteria, basically a sea slime. And then that sea slime replicates over and over again. And eventually there's a mutation and the, the mutation it's an archaea, and each time there's another mutation, we get a sort of a larger sort of life form. And each time there's a new life form, we bring in different styles of music, or different sounds of music. But those, those, those pieces of music loop, and uh, eventually by the time we get to human, you know, we go through fish and amphibians and reptiles and mammals and then finally human. By the time we get there, it's this wall of sound, this cacophony of sound, uh, and then we hear the human voice singing. And then... Uh, once we become human, the next 
scene of this writing. This is all happening that that one writing session, right? You know, the next thing that happens is that we we migrate from Africa throughout the rest of the world, and each time we move to a different location in the world, a different region, we start to hear the indigenous music from those places, and then we see the dance forms, the indigenous dance forms from those places. Like now, it's like I'm sort of like composing this stage play. In, during this writing session. And so I see we're exploring all these different cultural uh, indigenous art forms from around the world. And then finally, you know, once we sort of do our journey around the world, uh, then I started to talk about the future. And for us, for me, for scientists, the future, the biggest problem that we have to solve right now is, is global climate change. So that became like the focus of that final scene is I go deep and heavy into global climate change and what the possibilities are from the very, very dark, from the very, very, like, the worst case scenario all the way to the best case scenario. And I build all these different, like, nine different scenarios of what could happen in regards to global climate change for our future. And then so, like, after I wrote that during this one writing session, I was like, oh, this is what I've been trying to do for my entire life. This is what this work, this this piece that I've just kind of, like, written out, this is what I stand for. This is what I, like, this is my life's work because I had spent the first half of my life studying science and then the second half of my life studying poetry and storytelling and to be able to synthesize all of it into one piece was the most meaningful thing that I had done and have done I think up to this point in time in my life. It sounds like it was in your heart the whole time like percolating Yeah, and and you were able to Sit down and just pour it out. Yes, and each step led to the next. I couldn't have written something like that when I was 18 or 19. I couldn't have written something like that when I was 25. Like I I had to go through sort of the training processes of each field of study, whether it was the the science or the art. Like Both of them had to to receive their proper attention, and then I could finally bring them together Mm -hmm. like under one sort of like unified idea. And I've heard other writers say that, that... You cogitate on things a long time, and you think about them and think about them, and then one day you can just sit down and write it out, and it just all just comes flowing out. Yep. And now that I hear you talk, it might be really dangerous for scientists and artists to get together. <laughs> yeah, you could have an explosion of sorts, right? The right. universe would cave in on itself if we did. <laughs> it's actually, <laughs> I actually love those moments where um, different disciplines can get together and just hang out and talk story and really just learn from each other and be open to the expertise that the other person brings, you know? And so uh, it's actually really fun. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and explosive. <laughs> and explosive, yeah. So how close to you, I don't know if that's the right question, but how close are you to your cultural roots? And does that play a part in your poetry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am deeply close to my cultural roots. It is it is something that I grew up with. I mean, I grew up as a hula dancer and have sort of, you know, learned the language. I'm not fluent. I'm not anywhere near where I should be, but able to understand enough so that, so that you know, it, it hits me on a, on a deeper level. And, you know, so those types of things and, and listening to sort of the elders of our community and like sort of, you know, I mean, we're taught to just listen from a very young age, just and not really talk. <laughs> you know, you're you're basically a sponge. So you're just listening, listening, listening to all this wisdom and knowledge and stories. And then eventually, when you get older, you start to realize, oh, that's what those stories were about. Like they were trying to teach me these lessons. And and then you start to tell your own stories. And you start to tell those stories as well as your own stories. So the closeness is there. And I, I use that cultural knowledge and base in what I do all the time. You know, just going back to like that play that I was talking about, that story, of, it's called The Story of Everything. There's two scenes in particular that draw heavily from Hawaiian culture. One, the first one is the evolution scene where we go from single-celled organism to human. So there's this ancient chant that we have this thing was composed in the 1700s, like so the century before Darwin came out with the origin of species. But what it does is it's called the Kumulipo, and it's our origin chant. It's like where we come from, sort of from a Hawaiian perspective. And what it starts off with is like at first it was darkness, and then there was sea slime, and then was born coral polyps, worms, and starfish, and then was born, and, and, you know, and then was born plants, right? Uh, you know, and then was born 
the fish, the sharks, and the rays, and then was born, and it goes higher and higher life forms up to like reptiles, and then mammals, and then finally human. It's basically evolution theory wrapped up in one, I think it's like 2,000 lines long chant that was passed on from generation to generation through oral traditions, composed in the 1700s. And so when I was figuring out this piece, the Kumulipo was coming out through my writing. I mean, like, my writing was heavily influenced by the Kumulipo as well as evolution theory. You know, what we now know is just evolution. The Hawaiian side was totally influencing what I was writing as well as the science side, and I was able to synthesize that right there. The Earth, the Sun, and the Moon story, the love story, was also heavily oh, influenced by the culture. That one is told in pidgin language, which is what we speak on the streets in Hawaii. It's sort of like a, a, a different sounding type of English. It was what they spoke on the plantations when they had all different kinds of cultures uh, on the plantations, um, from English speaking to Hawaiian speaking to Japanese to Chinese to Filipino to Gaelic. And the folks, they had to figure out a way to like communicate with each other. So I bring in the pidgin language into that scene, and that scene is a very like old school Hawaii sort of like telling of a story, you know? Yeah, and and I love the way you you brought in history and culture and contemporary, and you just brought it all, melded it all together to create a beautiful poetic piece. I really appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Cool, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you for being here. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why? Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities with support from Wyoming Community Foundation and generous supporters like you. To learn more, go to thinkwhy.org, subscribe, and never miss a show. 